All right. Welcome back to the My Sugar Free Journey podcast. I am joined today by Stephanie Seneff. So Stephanie is a senior research scientist at MIT, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. She received her BS degree in biophysics in 1968, the MS and EE degree, uh, degrees in electrical engineering in 1980, PhD degree in electrical engineering and computer science in 1985, all from MIT. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why do we have a computer scientist and electrical engineer on a podcast that's mostly about health? Well, for, for the last three decades, she, her research interests have always been at the intersection of biology and computation, and she has spent more and more and more time lately dealing with uh, the nutritional and, and biological components of our world. She's concentrating mainly on the relationship between nutrition and health. And since 2011, she has published over two dozen papers in various medical and health related journal journals on topics such as modern day diseases like Alzheimer's, autism, cardiovascular disease, analysis and search of databases of drug side effects using NLP techniques, and the impact of nutritional deficiencies and environmental toxins on human health. And today, oh, and I should mention, she's got a new book coming out probably next year about what we're going to talk about today, which is mostly glyphosate. I want to talk about glyphosate. We just had uh, Elliot Overton on the podcast I'll say, about two months ago, and the things that he had to say about glyphosate were very interesting. So I wanted to go to the source. I wanted to talk to somebody who spent a great deal of time talking about this. And um, so I found, I found Stephanie. So uh, Stephanie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So like I've, like I've mentioned a couple of times here, I, I'm really interested in this topic because I don't think enough... Um, I don't think enough concern has been given uh, about glyphosate in general and just our agricultural processes uh, in general. I guess glyphosate in particular, our agricultural processes in general. We've got 300 million people that we're trying to feed in uh, this country. And uh, we are doing a pretty good job, but it doesn't seem like we should be doing <laughs> that good a job feeding all these people with uh, the amount of land and the amount of resources that we, uh, we're getting into. So I know we're cutting some corners and we're, we're probably, I'm sorry, Dan, can you turn that off? Um, with, uh, I'm sorry, my, my wife is sitting next to me. Uh, with, we're cutting some corners with, uh, with some of the, the, the processes that we're using. So I want to find out mostly about glyphosate because this has been in the news so much. I mean, we've got a huge uh, multi-million dollar trial going on against Bayer, where it looks like glyphosate has given uh, some farmer cancer. And if they win, well, they've already won one, but it's in appeal right now. But if they win, this... I mean, this could bankrupt Bayer. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to see how this is going. So, Stephanie, give us the lowdown. But first of all, what is glyphosate and why is it everywhere? First of all, I want to say there's two trials that have won uh, significant amounts of money, 68 million and 80 million, and there's a third one going on now, which is a couple. All of these people are not farmers. They're people who deal with glyphosate in other, uh, in other ways. In fact, two of them are just on their own property, people using it for their own property. And the third one was a, a, a school grounds keeper who used glyphosate shockingly on children's schools, the yards of the, the schools. And um, so the uh, agriculture is harder to nail because those guys are exposed to so many other chemicals that you can right. always say it was something else that caused it. Although many people in agriculture are getting non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And there are now 13,000 people behind these three cases so far. And the third one is, is coming to a head right now. They just had the closing um, remarks, uh, I think, yesterday or something. And so it's very close. The, the jury is probably in deliberation right now with this new one. And the, uh, the plaintiff's lawyer is, is asking them to consider awarding him huge amounts of money. Huge amounts. Yeah. So, so we'll see. I mean, it's exciting. I'm actually very encouraged about all of this because I'm starting to see ways in which glyphosate can go down more quickly than I would have imagined. I, I feel it has to be banned worldwide if we have a future. I really think it's that bad. I think it's the most dangerous chemical in our environment today. And partly that's because it's so pervasive. You know, it's right. the most used chemical in agriculture, combined with the fact that we think it's safe. So people use it carelessly. And it's all over the place. I mean, it's not just, it's not just the exposure to the people who are handling the glyphosate, because it's getting all over our food supply. It's in our tampons. It's in our pampers. It's in, probably in our drugs and our vaccines. So it's really very, very worrisome to think about um, the consequences of, of the chronic exposure of the entire population uh, in varying degrees, 
and then to correlate that with the health issues we're all having. And I believe that glyphosate is, in fact, the most important chemical behind the, the mess we're seeing right now with respect to the children's health in this country, the autism, the ADHD, the depression, even the shootouts, you know, the violent behavior, all of these things I think are connected to uh, chronic glyphosate exposure. Well, let's talk about autism real quick. Um, doing some research, I found an old quote from you that uh, I, it seemed shocking, and I wanted to give you a chance to, uh, to kind of uh, go over it. Um, this was in a 2014 speech um, that you gave that you said, by 2025, one in two children will be autistic. That seems like an absolutely outrageous number. Do you still stand by that? I, or? I don't. I don't okay. actually. And in fact, at that time, I said, I said roughly by the quarter century mark, and I hadn't done the math. And it was really, I was trying to wake people up because I see autism going up exponentially. And I sort of had just roughly, you know, so people have put that 2025 up there on the map, uh, you know, all, all over the internet. Right. I, when I computed it uh, accurately by drawing, you can actually plot the, the growth uh, on a log scale and you'll see that it's linear on a log scale, which means it's exponential growth. And, and the uh, numbers that are coming out of the CDC are for uh, 12 year olds. So you have to figure 12 years into the future for, if you think about kids being born today, 12 years into the future is where that exponential growth is going to be much higher for those kids being born today. If you know what I'm saying, it's much yeah. higher rate for the people being born today than it is for the 12 year olds today. And when you project that line into the future, you get 2032. So it's seven years later as the magic number when uh, half the children who are born in 2032 will end up eventually on the autism spectrum if that exponential growth continues unabated. Exponential growth usually slows up down as the numbers get big, so we can hope it won't be. But I really want to put in that shock factor because I'm annoyed that the government is ignoring this problem. And the schools are certainly feeling the, the heat because it's all over the country. You've got schools that are burdened with all these kids, not just the autism. That's sort of the tip of the iceberg because you've got the ADHD and all the, uh, all the uh, food allergies and the asthma and the eczema. I mean, there's just so many different health issues, the obesity, the diabetes, type 1 diabetes is, uh, is going up dramatically. All these things are going up in our population. And there's a reason why it's happening, and that's what I'm interested in figuring out. Yeah, that's definitely what I'm interested in talking to you about because I see the same thing. I, you know, I'm looking at an America that is getting fatter, that is getting sicker, uh, where rates of every disease. I mean, we talked about autism, and I got to I got to say, just the idea that one in two children at any point in the future would be diagnosed with autism seems like an absolutely unbelievable number. But you know, I'm gonna just I'm gonna defer I'm gonna defer to you for that for now. I guess we'll check back in in 2032 and, and right. <laughs> But, um, but I do think that one in two Americans, that way more than one in two Americans are going to be sick. Um, if, if, you know, I was, in fact, some new stats came out just this morning that said uh, only 10%, or I think it was 12%, only 12% of Americans over the age of 40 are metabolically healthy. That's insane. I mean, that is, that's, that's crazy. yeah, it is absolutely crazy. So I like, and I know that it is, it's probably not, you know, it's not feasible to, to think like this, but I like when big problems have simple solutions yeah. because it means there's one thing that I can avoid. Um, the solution that I found for me is I don't eat sugars, I don't eat grains, I don't eat polyunsaturated fats, I do eat more red meat. But in, in the midst of doing that, I know that I eat a lot less glyphosate, you know, because yeah, I'm just, right. I'm not eating the things that, that are treated by, uh, by some of these chemicals. So maybe in the, in the course of me changing my diet, uh, I've, I've accidentally eliminated one of the key factors that is affecting my health. I suspect so, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and I hope so, because again, I like when big problems have simple solutions and yeah. just changing my diet has been a simple solution that's fixed, you know, a hundred different problems. Yeah. That's great. So, yeah. So glyphosate, um, is causing all of these problems. Why? So I, so I guess the first question I have is why are, um, why are we as a, as a nation, as the government or whatever, why are we so resistant to the idea that, uh, that glyphosate is causing this problem? And what, what can we do about it, I guess, is probably the best question. Right. I mean, I think a lot of the problem is that uh, glyphosate is so embedded in our agriculture at this point that 
the government probably believes that if we didn't have glyphosate, we would be in huge trouble with the food supply. I mean, I'm guessing right. that's what they think. And certainly it would cost a lot more money to grow the food because growing organically means you've got to deal with the weeds in some other way that may involve human labor. And uh, we're going to lose all the immigrants because we're, sh- we're cutting the border. So we're going to have a bigger problem right. with who's going to pull the weeds, right? Exactly. Because, you, I mean, that's how you used, to, you used to be that you grew food. You dealt with the weeds by hand, you know. And right. you could imagine robotics uh, solutions. I mean, I think there are other solutions that could be done. And, and certainly uh, sustainable, renewable agriculture is where we need to be. One of the things that's happening is that we are destroying the soil. The yeah. glyphosate is a major player in that. And the soil is getting less and less healthy every year. The food crops, therefore, are hurting. They're getting you know, fungus diseases. There's a lot of issues going on with the food. Drought, they're more sensitive to droughts because they're, the plants are not as hardy because they don't have enough minerals. You know, glyphosate is uh, making the minerals unavailable to them. Um, so the yields are going down. I mean, it, when they first introduced glyphosate, it was terrific. It's one of those things where you get, you get sucked in because in the early years, things are going well. And then the weeds start to get resistant. You have to use more glyphosate uh, to kill them. And the soil starts to get messed up. The earthworms start getting harmed by the glyphosate. And then the soil is just not healthy. The plants don't grow as well. They get susceptible to fungus. Now you've got to use more fungicides, you know, which is increasing our exposure to those. So it's really a downward spiral into uh, a very bad situation. And we're starting to see issues with things like drought, you know, and flooding. These are because the soil doesn't hold water. Mm. Plants aren't able to utilize water as well as they used to be able to because of, of the glyphosate poisoning. So all of this is contributing to a, uh, there's going to be, I think, a huge crisis in agriculture, which is going to be actually glyphosate is going to start failing. And it actually already is starting to fail because there are, there are, are weeds that are so resistant to glyphosate that they've had to start introducing other chemicals on top of the glyphosate into the formulation. Really? So they put in glyphosate plus 2,4-D or glyphosate plus dicam, but those two are very nasty herbicides that are being added in to the glyphosate mix. And then they're producing crops that have a GMO resistance to those other herbicides on top of the resistance to glyphosate. So um, these solutions are not going to work in the long term. If we got rid of glyphosate, I'm sorry, if we got rid of glyphosate, what would the, what what do you think would happen to the, to the cost of a loaf of bread in say five years? Well, one big question is whether we would simply replace it with other herbicides, in which case we're still going to get sick. It'll be different set of diseases. Because I think all of the herbicides are very, very toxic. Right now, they boast because they say we can use glyphosate instead of all these other herbicides that are supposed to be much more toxic than glyphosate. That's why we're we're using it, because it's supposed to be so safe. And if we abandon glyphosate and and don't replace it with organic agriculture, we're going to be in trouble with other diseases from these other exposures to these other chemicals. Hmm. That's interesting. So... um... Then, then let's get into some of the biochemistry. Um, for I, I actually, I'm sorry. Let me back up a little bit because I jumped right into glyphosate. I, I there was there was a couple things I wanted to kind of flesh out before we got into what glyphosate does. How did you, as a computer scientist, how did you decide to to start looking into this? I mean, what what was that road like? Yeah, it was an interesting story actually. So it was about uh, 12 years ago, I think, when I, I was I've been paying attention to autism for a long time because I actually had a best friend way back when. Gosh, 30 years ago, uh, she had a son who was a little younger than my son, and he got a DPT shot. He had a high fever. He had a piercing scream. He was obviously very uncomfortable after that shot. He had seizures a week later, and then he regressed into severe autism after that. So I had personal experience with autism early on, but back when it was quite rare, and also with the idea that vaccines might be related to autism. So that kind of Um, I was watching autism and I started to see the rates going up exponentially in the early 2000s. And I thought there's something going on here. And of course, most of this funding is on genetics. They're like, this is a genetic disease and you need to find the genes. And they find a huge list of genes, each of which has a small component of the explanation of the, and many of the kids don't have any of those genes. So it's clearly a messy story with respect to genes. And I think that things that are going up exponentially cannot be, it can't be just genes. It might be the genes increase your, your vulnerability to the toxic exposures, but it's got to be toxic exposures that are causing the epidemic. So I wanted to find out what it was. And I spent five years actually looking at lots of things, not looking at glyphosate at all, 
uh, because Roundup is safe. I mean, that's like everybody knows that, you know. And it was really just happened to be blind luck that I was at a conference where Don Huber, Professor Don Huber, retired professor from Purdue University, did a two-hour presentation on glyphosate. I didn't know the word glyphosate when I walked into the talk. But I thought, oh, this is interesting. I better find out what this is. And by the time I was finished with those two hours, I knew I had found the answer. I mean, I was that convinced. It was amazing because he was explaining all these things that glyphosate does, which matched the things I was seeing as symptoms of autism. It was a perfect match. Okay. Well, then let's read a whole bunch of other stuff and did a whole bunch of research to confirm it. But now I'm even more certain that I'm right. Okay. Well, then let's let's get into to that. Then what does glyphosate do to the human body? I mean, a crucial thing is the gut microbes. It's, it disrupts the gut microbes, and that's crucial in autism. It's now finally becoming well recognized, I think, even by the mainstream, that the gut is messed up in many of these autistic kids. They have a lot of food sensitivities. They have diarrhea, they have constipation, they have pain, and bloating, all these different issues with their gut. And, um, and in fact, there's some encouraging results, and new, brand new papers coming out showing that fecal transplant uh, can help to... Uh, to to improve, improve autistic symptoms. So there's a lot of excitement about using fecal transplants to try to recover a microbiome that's healthier than the one they have uh, to treat autism. Um, so I knew that the autistic gut was messed up before I heard about glyphosate. And he right. talks squarely about glyphosate messing up the gut microbiome. And that's because the microbes have the enzyme that glyphosate famously disrupts in the plants. So the whole story that Monsanto gives is that glyphosate disrupts the shikimate pathway and a specific enzyme in that pathway, and that we don't have that pathway in our cells. It's a biological pathway that our cells don't have, and therefore we're completely insensitive to glyphosate. That's a really lovely story, and I wish it were true, <laughs> but that's what they say. But they're overlooking the fact that our gut microbes not only have that pathway, but they use it to produce um, molecules that are essential for us because we can't make those things, and it's the aromatic amino acids. And I, 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 I want to... I want to stop on that for just a minute because that's the point that I think in most of my research on the subject that keeps getting bandied about and, and not, and there's, there's no real clear, like there was studies that said that they, they actually fed animals, they fed them glyphosate and it, most of it was metabolized out and, and it just passed through the, the, it passed through the body unharmed and no one's saying that glyphosate is or isn't, you know, isn't you know metabolized by the body it it seems to not be metabolized by the body it seems to be metabolized by the microbes in the body yes, that's right. what's actually causing the damage and that's what you're finding correct right well the microbes are, are metabolizing it which is great and if you've got microbes in your gut that can break it down that's awesome you know and uh, but the problem is that the microbes that we critically depend on especially early in life so when the baby's born bifidobacteria are a major dominant species in the gut and you need the, the child needs those to be there in order to handle the milk, you know, to be able to process the milk correctly. Exactly. And the bifidobacteria get nailed by glyphosate. They are one, I think they were the most sensitive of all the species that were studied in the paper that I have. Bifidobacteria get, get nailed. And, and um, so they become depleted. And then species like Clostridia and Salmonella gain a foothold. And then they cause disease because they're pathogens. They start to get an inflamed gut and get the immune system going off and doing nasty things to the gut barrier. You get a leaky gut barrier. And then you also get disrupted uh, metabolism of proteins in particular, which causes autoimmune disease through a me mechanism called molecular mimicry because the immune cells react to the undigested proteins, for example, in gluten. Gluten intolerance, I think, is a glyphosate-based disease, the, the epidemic. <laughs> I should, you know, I have to qualify that because obviously it existed before glyphosate, but we now have an epidemic in gluten intolerance. And I think it's due to the glyphosate that's in the wheat. Wheat is not a GMO crop, but it's t very commonly sprayed with glyphosate right before the harvest as a desiccant. And it's showing up, you know, in the wheat-based foods. That's been confirmed by various consumer groups who have, who have measured, have found glyphosate in these foods. And I think, you know, and I think that's, uh, so, you know, one of the things that, that um, gets blamed for the gluten um, epidemic that's going on, uh, or gluten insens insens insensitivity epidemic, is that the wheat that we're eating is not the same wheat that we yeah. ate 200 years ago. Yeah. But it's not the same wheat because, you know, not only have we genetically modified it, but we've genetically modified it, I think, specifically so that we could spray weed killer on it and, and get a more bountiful harvest. Is, 
so is it the weed? Is it the glyphosate? Is it both these things, you know, working together? Is, can you, can human beings eat uh, like an archival wheat that hasn't been sprayed by, by glyphosate and not have any issues? Well, there was an experiment that was done, which was a, a, a controlled study where they had these people who had a gluten intolerance, they had inflammatory gut, um, and they fed them um, heirloom, organic heirloom wheat, so an ancient, you know, seed organically grown compared to the regular wheat that we eat today. And they showed that when they were eating the heirloom wheat, they had enormous reductions in their inflammatory gut disorder uh, compared to when they were eating the, the wheat we grow today. And they were saying it was heirloom versus the not heirloom, but I say it's the, it's the organic versus the not organic. And they didn't control for that. I mean, if you had fed them organic wheat grown today, today's you know, gene line organically grown, you might be fine. It, it might be entirely the glyphosate that's the problem which is what I believe. Right. Yeah. And I know that one of the issues with weed is that, it, you know, you're, you're stimulating those dopamine receptors. It's addictive. And so you're, when you're taking in a poison, that's also addictive. It's a, I mean, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to, to get people off of. In fact, but that's, you see, it wouldn't be if you could digest it. And that's the other thing because Anthony Samsel is a person who's collaborated with me on several papers and he ordered porcine, trypsin, pepsin, and lipase. Those are digestive enzymes. Uh, produced by the pancreas. He ordered them from a lab and they were from pigs and he tested them for glyphosate and all three of them were highly contaminated with glyphosate. And so what that's hap what's happening, I think, is glyphosate is disrupting those enzymes' ability to do their job. And therefore, you can't break down the wheat. So not only is it making, well, and of course, we can get into this other theory that I have of it getting incorporated into the wheat protein and making the protein difficult to break down, but then getting into the digestive enzymes as well and making them unable to do their job. So you end up with these undigested gluten proteins that are the big problem with gluten. If you had been able to digest them, it would be fine. But it's because of your digestive issues that, that you get in trouble with wheat. So my understanding is, is that we take in gluten. We can't digest it well because we've messed up our, our gut microbiome with glyphosate and probably some other environmental factors. The gluten is... Um, irritates the bowels uh, to the point where the gluten can actually fit between the, the tight junctions and escape into the bloodstream where it causes havoc. I mean, it just causes all kinds right. of problems. Is, is that what, is, is that what you see? That's absolutely right. Yeah. The gluten actually has been shown to loosen up those tight jun junctions. So it actually, the undigested gluten causes a reaction in the gut that opens up the, the barriers. So that's where you get the leaky gut barrier. And that really causes trouble because then the gluten gets out, out into the general circulation. It gets into the lymph system. It gets into the blood. And that's when the immune cells get really upset and they start attacking. Especially them. the thyroid, right? It really, really messes yeah. up the thyroid. Well, it's really interesting. It's interesting biology because it's the, it's the similarity of the peptide sequence. So it's a match. You know, there's a partial match between the gluten peptide and the peptides that are in the, um, in the thyroid. And so you get the body starts attacking the thyroid because of, misdirecting it's like it's got it's nearsighted it can't see very well and it makes a mistake and thinks that the thyroid protein is actually gluten and and then uh, you know reacts with it and causes trouble hmm. mm -hmm. so you mentioned that um that uh, you think glyphosate is actually changing the genetic makeup of of the wheat that's uh, that's interesting that's not something i've heard before what what do you think is going on there well, very, very interesting. And this is where uh, I'm really, really excited about this. And I'm, I'm deeply into it. I'm, I'm obsessed, actually, with this idea, because I, I'm almost positive that I'm right. And it's extremely controversial. Pretty much uh, everybody is saying that it can't, it can't, it's not possible. So this is a very interesting, uh, two different points of view, kind of like the anti-vaxxers versus the pro-vaxxers, you know, where both sides feel absolutely certain. Um, I believe that the Monsanto folks know this is happening. And they know that if, if people find out it's game over for glyphosate. So that's why they're trying very hard to, to, to make sure that people know that I'm not trustworthy and that what I'm saying is completely ridiculous and impossible and all of that. Because they, there's tremendous evidence, starting with Monsanto's own research done back in the 1980s, quite remarkable in my opinion. And so um, the idea is not that it changes the genome. It doesn't change the DNA code. But what it does is it pretends to be glycine. Uh, glyphosate is a complete glycine molecule. Glycine is a, an amino acid. It's the smallest amino acid. It has no side chains. Glyphosate also has no side chains. It looks just like glycine. But what glyphosate has that's different from glycine is that it has something attached to its nitrogen atom. And that's what makes it different from glycine. But that also is a whole story for why it's toxic. 
but because it looks like glycine, the body is fooled. And all these different mechanisms in biology that make use of glycine get confused and end up substituting glyphosate for glycine. Even as a neurotransmitter, glycine is a neurotransmitter and glyphosate can substitute for glycine and cause trouble in the brain. But the biggie, which is a really interesting idea, is that it can get into proteins during the assembly of the DNA. Uh, the DNA code assembles the uh, proteins as amino acids like beads on a string or paper dolls holding hands. The amino acids all join together to make a long string, that's a protein. And the DNA code is what tells you which amino acid to put where. So when you see a code for glycine and you're assembling these beads on a string, you grab a glycine, stick it in, but it's not glycine, it's glyphosate, and you made a mistake. And then, so you end up with glyphosate in, embedded in the protein. Mm. And so that has incredibly interesting consequences for certain proteins in certain positions. And that's where the puzzle gets very, very interesting because there's a yeah. lot of proteins out there and certain ones have certain glycines that are absolutely essential. And if those glycines are changed to something else, the protein misbehaves in big ways. I mean, it's really an interesting story and it's very complicated. So I, just, just so I'm clear, that, that substitution of glyphosate for glycine, does that happen in the wheat or in us? Everywhere. In every, in every biological system that uses proteins, which is basically all of life, okay. everywhere. In, in the microbes, in our cells, uh, in the wheat, in the, plant, in the plants that we eat, everywhere. So I know glycine is incredibly important. Um, you know, in fact, I, I even supplement glycine um, because smart, it's, very smart. <laughs> yeah, it's not something that uh, we get in, in huge supply uh, or I think in, in big enough supply. Um, but, uh, and, and I'm, and I, um, but the podcast that I listened to that made the case that glycine is very important and needs to be supplemented, you know, glyphosate wasn't mentioned in that. And, and I, and I'm curious now I'd like to go back and, and, uh, maybe call it, it was, it was Chris Masterjohn. I'm going to go again, call back into Chris Masterjohn. Yeah. Tell, ask what he knows I, I didn't realize he was recommending glycine. I like him. He's done some interesting work. Um, I believe you need to extra glycine to compete out, compete glyphosate. So if you've got more glycine, you're much, your protein assembly process is much less likely to pick up a glyphosate by mistake. If there's plenty of glycine, it's just a matter of out competing the glyphosate. So you need to have more to help uh, prevent the glyphosate from getting in less glyphosate, more glycine is what you need. Yeah, I, just, to, just to make a case for glycine to my readers, uh, you might think about using it as a sweetener uh, because if you're not eating sugar, it's, it's, it's kind of sweet. It's just sweet enough that you don't, maybe don't have to use any kind of uh, artificial sweetener. So I'll put a teaspoon or two in my tea at the end of the night. It's pretty good. tastes tastes great. And, and uh, it's, it's healthier for you, I think, than, say, an artificial sweetener like uh, Sweet and Low or something like oh, that. Oh, that's so, a good, great idea. Yeah, that's you might check it out. Yeah. It's not super sweet, but when you're not eating sugar, you don't really need a whole lot of sweet. So right. check it out, check yeah. it out. Okay, so, that, so that's interesting. So we, we've got something that seems to be mimicking a basic fundamental building block of our, uh, of our biology that isn't quite right, and that, that may be what's causing a lot of the issues. Um, I assume this is more dangerous uh, the, the sooner in life you are uh, exposed to it. Right. Um, and does it, can it be transferred through breast milk? Yes, I think so. I think the breast milk, that's why we have casein intolerance. We have a, an epidemic in casein intolerance along with gluten intolerance. And I think it's in the breast milk and it's incorporated into the casein in the milk and making the casein hard to break down. Uh, that's what I think, yes. Very interesting. So a lot okay. of the food intolerances, in fact, the foods that people are intolerant to all can be expected to have glyphosate in them. You know, the, the, we have these various food allergies that are epidemics today. Yeah. And you can pretty much glyphosate can account for many of them. Well, let's talk about my favorite food because I want to know, you know, what's, what's the exposure uh, steak or just, just mm -hmm. meat in general. What uh, can, can glyphosate be transferred into cows, pigs, chicken, into their muscle meat? Absolutely. Uh, I think so. And uh, I think that's very dangerous. Uh, one of the really big concerns of mine is collagen and a lot of people are supplementing collagen. Yes. Um, and collagen is a extremely has extremely high level of glycine in it. There's a whole section, a long section of collagen that has a pattern that's GXY, 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 which means that there's every third amino acid is a glycine. And then XY are wild cards for the other amino acids. And so that is actually really important for the collagen structure. Collagen has a beautiful triple helix stru uh, structure that it forms when it folds to get folds into its uh, active shape. And if you start putting glyphosates in place of those glycines, you're going to mess up that triple helix structure. 
Uh, but that's also, that also means that if you're eating coll collagen, you're going to be eating uh, glyphosate embedded in that collagen, which I think could end up uh, with uh, autoimmune attack on your joints because the collagen in your joints would become, uh, through this molecular mimicry process, the collagen in the food is not that different from the collagen in your joints and your body could end up attacking your joints because of that. Hmm. So most cows are fed grass for the first 80% of their life. Then they're taking capos and they're where they're fed grain. So they're only eating grain usually for the, the last, I think it's six months. Of their Is life. that true? I didn't know that. I thought they were capo cows for their whole life. No. And we've had several people in here talk about it. Um, so this is like every cow that you, that you get, all of them say grass fed. they all of them can say grass fed because for most of their life, they are grass fed. It's only when you put them in the CAFO that that's when the differentiation uh, starts that between grass fed versus grass fed, grass finished. So the grass finished cows are on pasture for their entire lives. The grass fed cows are on grass for 80% of their lives. The last six months or so, then they're putting CAFOs. They're just shoved, you know, grain is just shoved into their mouth until they're <laughs> big fat and then they're slaughtered, whatever. Um, that's really sad, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> Although it really I did is. not realize, I actually thought they were born and bred entirely in the CAFO. I, I didn't know that they spend part of their life on, on the grass. That's very interesting. Yeah, you might talk to, uh, um, oh gosh, I forget his name, the, the Ruminati guy. Um, um, oh God, I'll, 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 I'll think of his name later. And uh, because he's, he's an agriculture expert and I've, I've had him on here at least once. I'm trying to get back on here again uh, as, as he talks about that. So the, the only reason I brought that up is because I'm interested in, in how much the, the grain affects the, uh, affects the, the fats in, uh, in these cows mm. uh, in, in a short amount of time. Um, mm. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I do know that cows aren't a huge source of either omega-3 or omega-6 fats. They don't have, they don't have a huge amount of either one, hmm. but any, any change would be, you know, would be, would be something, um, you know, and I don't, I don't know how you would test for that. So when, when beef is labeled as grass fed, does that mean it didn't go into the CAFO? No, when beef is labeled grass fed, it means that it could have gone into the CAFO. Yes. The only way that you know for sure is if it says grass fed, grass finished. So the finished is the last six months of, of, of life. So what if it's not, if it isn't labeled grass fed, what does that mean? Well, then it definitely went to a cable. <laughs> that, but, but like, that's interesting. I, 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 was, I had a misconception because I kind of really thought either you went cable all the way or you went grass all the way. I mean, I understood about finishing. I know about that, but I thought mm -hmm. there were cows that never saw grass basically. No, that's uh, that that was a that was a surprising thing to me. But uh, yeah. but cows are uh, the first. Uh, I want to say they're slaughtered at two years. So for, I believe for the first year and a half of their life, they're they're pastured, that's all of them, uh, because you can't. Uh, I forget exactly what the explanation was, but you just you it's 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 um, financially untenable to keep them confined for two years. Whereas you, you know, you contrast that with pigs, you can cut, you can slaughter pigs in months. You can slaughter uh, chickens in days. So you can keep those in these large, I mean, you could take a chicken from a chick to, uh, to a full grown chicken in weeks uh, yeah. and just feed them tons and tons of grain. Right. And, um, and uh, you know, get, get a slaughter from them. And uh, in fact, it doesn't go over beef, but if a really good um, uh, documentary on this is on Netflix right now. It's called Rotten, mm -hmm. and it's a six-part documentary, and it, each part of the documentary goes over one section of our food supply and explains mm -hmm. how we've screwed it up. That's and good. There's one, yeah, there's, there's one on chickens, uh, yeah. you know, how we've, how we've messed with chickens. Uh, the one on honey is also very interesting as well. Like, it's, uh -huh. it's hard to actually get honey now. You, you can't, unless you buy it from a farmer who's making honey, you're, you, if you just buy it off the shelf, you're probably just getting sweetened, uh, sweetened corn syrup. Interesting. Um, yeah, it is. It, anyway, I, I digress. But uh, that's what this is what I'm interested. In. I'm interested in food, yeah. how, you know, how we get our food. And it's to the point where you almost have to stand over your food from the day it's born to the day it dies. I know you can to, know everything about it, right? Yeah, you do. You really do. Because you don't know what's going into it. And, and the more you know, the more you're reluctant to eat the stuff, you know, <laughs> you start to wonder what you're going to eat. It's quite interesting. Well, I've I've wondered, you know, I'm, I'm not a carnivore, but I've, I've wondered if maybe that's not something I should get into where I'm just eating meat because it's hard to, 
it's hard to find a, a vegetable that doesn't have yeah. some kind of problem, whether it be oxalate or lectins or glyphosate or, you know, it's, it's hard to, to find those, to, fi- to find that food that uh, seems to be um, beneficial or totally beneficial to the human body. Uh, the rest of it just seems to be a, a trade-off. You know, you're just, you're, you're doing the best that you can with what you got. So. And it's interesting because there are certain like tribes in Africa and also people way up North who live entirely on animal-based products and yeah. on blood and, uh, and, and uh, meat-based products and, and uh, organ meats and all of that. And they're perfectly healthy. This, you know, this is really interesting. I think it's Sami warriors or something in Africa. And then of course the Eskimos yeah, in the old days, they used to just live on, you know, blubber from the seals and things like that because they couldn't grow vegetables. It was too short a growing season. And yet they did just fine with, um, yep. with that diet. It's just quite surprising because we we're always told how wonderful vegetables are. And it's interesting yeah. to me to see this uh, vegan phenomenon taking off the way it has, you know, just sort of the yeah. polar opposite probably of what you're doing in a way. My favorite, my favorite hashtag to follow on Twitter is X vegan because every day there's some new vegan that uh, said, Hey guys, I had to eat meat because uh, my teeth started falling out. My yeah. hair started falling out. You know, I, I couldn't really walk did. anymore. And so I decided to eat meat for my health. It's like, come on people. <laughs> can we not, yeah. can we not uh, you know, check these stories out. N- nobody eats a mostly meat diet and says in six months, Oh, I had to stop because oh, yeah. uh, it was killing me. Yeah. But, uh, you, the vegans, uh, there's these poor vegans that are out there believing that they are, that that's an optimal way to, to eat. And it's just, it messes with their mind. It messes with their body. It messes with yeah. everything. And it's just, it's I just, totally not, agree. Yeah. just not healthy. Um, and it is the, the other thing I was going to say is it is interesting that you could find these all meat, uh, cultures that thrive. You can't find a vegan diet that has thrived, right. uh, a vegan culture. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, right. They, they, uh, if somebody tries to eat all vegetables, they usually either starve to death or get conquered by a neighboring tribe pretty quick. <laughs> right. Yeah. Although I guess the, you know, the India, people in India have lived a vegetarian life for many, many centuries, but it's a uh, vegetarian is a lot better than vegan. If you're yeah. allowed to eat cheese and any kind of meat pro- or any kind of animal products. Once you get be. dairy, I think you're much better off or eggs, you know, eggs yeah. and dairy. I think that can work. Mm. Um, but, but without that, I don't understand how these people are surviving. So just, just to get back to glyphosate for a minute, um, uh, so we've, we've looked at how these, the, the, the biochemistry between how, what it's doing, okay? So it's, mm. it's messing with our ability to, uh, to process food. It's messing with our ability to digest food. It's, 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 it's malnourishing us in, in probably different ways. It's leaving uh, us with chronic long-term inabilities to break down certain foods. That's why people have gluten insensitivity, dairy insensitivity, or at least maybe one of the reasons why these things are happening. So you've mentioned autism. What other diseases, or you can even talk more about autism if you want, but what other diseases are we seeing as a result of, or do you think that we're seeing as a result of glyphosate exposure? It's a huge list. And it's basically autoimmune disease, neurological disease, and oncological disease, which is cancer. All three are going up dramatically in step with glyphosate. I have a whole bunch of plots, quite fascinating. Even something like sleep disorder correlates with glyphosate. We're having a huge problem with sleep disorder these days. And that's correlated with all kinds of neurological diseases. Alzheimer's is a perfect match. Autism is a perfect match. What I'm saying is that if you look at the rate of glyphosate usage on corn and soy crops over time in this country. There's data on that on on the web. And you compare that to the increase in the rate of these various diseases, Alzheimer's, autism, pancreatic cancer, um, bladder cancer, uh, liver and kidney disease, diabetes, um, autism, ADHD, sleep disorder, um, various, you know, rheumatology, various kinds of inflammatory gut disorder, um, all these things are going up dramatically. And I think they're all connected to glyphosate exposure. We're all being slowly poisoned by this and it's accumulating in our tissues throughout our body in, embedded in proteins. Hmm. What That's about, it. what about, are we, can we uh, pass it on to the next generation? Is it, is it infecting our, our yeah, know? actually that's really interesting. There's a brand new article out really fascinating uh, study. And these people knew what they were doing. They exposed rats. So this is a, a study on rats and they exposed the pregnant rats to glyphosate um, only during a period of time during their pregnancy, a a selected period of time, which was a time they knew was critical for the development of the the germline of the fetus. 
So they were exposing the germline of the fetus to glyphosate over this short period. And the, the, the mother rat had no obvious uh, consequences from the glyphosate. She was fine. Her pups were born. They were fine too. They grew up. They had pups of their own. And that's when you started to see trouble. So it was the second and third generation that got in trouble in all kinds of ways. And there was a disruption of their reproductive system categorically. The mammary glands, the ovaries, the testes, um, the uh, prostate gland, all of them were messed up in the second and third generation. And the third generation had issues with kidney. I mean, it was just amazing how much trouble these offspring ran into as a consequence of an exposure of their grandmother, you know, to, to, uh, to glyphosate over a short period of time. While she was it reminds born. me of Pottinger's cats that uh, you've got that, you know, he, he uh, deprived them of a mineral. Sorry. Yeah, um, taurine, yeah, right? yeah, deprived them of taurine, and it wasn't until the third or fourth generations that they started seeing problems. So, the the second, third generation of rats were they exposed to glyphosate as well, or was it only that only, first? Generation? Only during that period. So the thing is that the fetus, the female fetus, fetus develops her her um, her uh, germline, her um, her ovaries develop their eggs very early in pregnancy. It's really interesting. So the female fetus is prepared already to have babies, <laughs> if you will. Her eggs are already formed early in pregnancy. It's quite, even before she has a brain, she forms her eggs. It's very, very interesting. In biology, that's how it works. And so they were exposed during that period when she was forming her eggs. That was the, they, they timed it perfectly for that. So that those eggs were being exposed to glyphosate as they were being developed. And that's what caused them to have epigenetic effects. It's basically modifications like the methylation, you know, all these epigenetic effects that go on that has memory. It's not that you're not changing the DNA, but you're modifying things in interesting ways that are going to carry through through multiple generations. And yeah, people have those, said these things can last for five or six or seven generations. It's one of those you know, odd biological facts that always kind of surprises me when, when I hear it is that the egg that made you didn't come from your mother. It came from your grandmother. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? It's so fascinating. I'm fascinated by that from the standpoint of the male versus the female because the, ma the female develops her eggs First chance she gets, right? As soon as she's uh, a, a fertilized egg, practically, she gets going with trying to make her own offspring. Mm -hmm. Whereas the male doesn't develop his sperm until the very last minute. So it's very different, very contrasted between the female and the male. And I suspect that has something to do with evolution, that the male is somehow, um, has experienced the entire lifespan. So he's, the male sperm are sort of sampling a whole extra, you know what I mean? It's really, it's yeah. intriguing. I don't have a good story there, but I find it very, very fascinating, that distinction between the male and the female. Yeah, biology is, is very fascinating. It's like as early as possible and as late as possible. It, it, mm -hmm. You know, it's contrastive. It's very interesting. I don't know what to so, make of it. <laughs> but. Yeah, no, no, I, I don't either. So um, what... I guess let's get into prevention if, if we can. Yeah. If, um, let's, do, let's do two ways. First way, if you don't have any problems, but you just want to avoid glyphosate exposure, what should you do? Well, absolutely organic diet. That's number one. Uh, by everything certified organic. And thank God we have that. You know, that's one thing I really appreciate. There's, there's a lot that I complain about with respect to America. But one thing good is that there's growing uh, accessibility of organic uh, certified organic food. Now, it may not be perfect, and I know there are ways to cheat, and the certification may not be as stringent as it could be, and there's all these caveats, but still, we have it. You know, it's a huge benefit to be able to buy certified organic food, and, and we do that when we shop. We never buy anything that's not certified organic. So, I know that the when you raise, when you're an organic farmer, you can still use pesticides. Is it just that you can't use glyphosate? Can't or or use what's, what's the deal? Synthetic. You can use natural, oh, um, oh, oh, okay. natural pesticides, but not synthetics. And glyphosate is definitely a synthetic. Interesting. Okay. That's very interesting. All right. Now let's go the other way. Let's say you have one of these issues. You have a gluten insensitivity. You have some neurological issues that you're trying to com combat against. You're, you've got whatever, you know, you've got a kid with autism. What, what should that person be doing? Well, there's additional things that everybody should do, and they'll probably be especially beneficial for those who are sick. I have been really focused on sulfur um, a lot in my research, and I'm convinced that we have a sulfur deficiency problem in the society systemically. Really? I think just about everybody in this country is deficient in sulfur. Uh, we don't get enough in our diet. The foods are depleted because glyphosate disrupts the uptake of sulfur into the, into the plant. So the plants have less sulfur than they should. And... Um, and then on top of that, glyphosate disrupts all kinds of enzymes that are involved with sulfur metabolism. 
Mm. And so the sulfur gets screwed up and you end up with actually sulfur toxicity along with sulfur deficiency at the same time. So some people have sulfur sensitivities and they end up avoiding sulfur containing foods. Yeah, my brother does, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's probably also in many cases caused by glyphosate. The glyphosate causes the sensitivity to sulfur because it disrupts the microbiome in ways that are really important for managing sulfur. And um, sulfur is tricky because sulfite is extremely toxic. And the microbes know how to convert sulfite into other things that are useful, but those enzymes get blocked by glyphosate. And so you end up with uh, poisoning your gut with sulfite if you're eating sulfur-containing foods, so you end up avoiding them. And now you've got, uh, over time, you get worse and worse in terms of your deficiencies in sulfur. Is there a uh, metabolite for sulfur that you can take that's, that directly, you know, that bypasses what, you, you know, what your body's trying to break down? Well, I recommend Epsom salt baths is one thing I recommend to people. For sulfur? Isn't that magnesium? Magnesium sulfate. And people don't realize oh, that. Magnesium they always sulfate. Think it's yeah, you're right. Magnesium. And it is for the magnesium. People usually think what you're getting is magnesium, but you're also getting sulfate. And the sulfate gets absorbed through the skin and it completely bypasses the gut because your gut microbes have trouble with sulfate. But if you let it come in through the skin, then you're, you're sort of protected from that. Oh, that makes sense. I, you know, I I had never thought about that. That's that's very interesting. So, um, it, yeah. In fact, I was just reading today that you know most people say if they eat onions, they'll get the sweet onions. But it does the sweet onions aren't sweeter. They they don't have more carbohydrate in them. They just have less sulfur in them. That's competing with the sweet yeah, taste. Okay. Yeah, and so that's sulfur is very bitter. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we've we've engineered a lot of yeah. the sulfur out of our <laughs> out of our That's diet. Right, because onions are a really good source of sulfur, and I eat a lot of them. I really like onions and garlic, and we always try to use them as, as spicing our food. Uh, very, we go through garlic like there's no tomorrow <laughs> in yep. in my family. Yeah, we do. We too. love garlic. We put it in our salad. We just put raw garlic chopped up in our salad. So um, the other thing is uh, fermented foods, and I especially like apple cider vinegar. We use Bragg's organic uh, apple oh, cider vinegar. We make our own salad dressing. Mm -hmm. And um, that's important for a very interesting reason, because acetobacter is a live virus, uh, live, live bacterium that's in the um, apple cider vinegar. And mm -hmm. it is one of the few microbes that can metabolize glyphosate. So it'll clear the glyphosate for you. And that so, is interesting. So, uh, so if you and so you're just talking about a few teaspoons, right? If you're taking a few yeah, teaspoons right, on a right, salad, exactly. you're yes, taking. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's. It's that easy to do. I really like a, a vinegar on my salad. It works beautifully. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah. So e either that or that and uh, olive oil olive or a little olive, olive oil and vinegar. Oil. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we do. A little and, salt, a little pepper. I'm good and to we go. have salad most days, you know. So I think that's a great way to, and you can start your dinner with a salad. So you're getting the acetobacter in there ready to go. If there's any glyphosate in your food, they'll be ready to ta t tackle it and take it down. If you get like a whole vegetable, so not, not you know, wheat where it's ground up and, you know, the, the glyphosate's throughout. But if you got a whole vegetable, like you got tomato, that the tomato plants were sprayed with glyphosate, but you rinse that tomato that that tomato off is it is the glyphosate inside the tomato or is it only on the outside you can't it's wash on, it off it's totally, it well off. especially if i'm right about it getting embedded into the proteins but it gets actively yeah. taken up by the cells that's one thing they found and it gets taken up on the amino acid transporters so those enzymes those um transporters act actively take up glyphosate because it is an amino acid so they're getting fooled all over the place because it's an amino acid that's a really important part of its toxicity mm. the fact that it's an amino acid well, that's terrifying. <laughs> Every once in a while, we'll have a guest on the show where after, at the end of it, I'm like, should I just radically change everything that I'm doing? And uh, this, this might be one of them. I'm going to I'm gonna have to think through this, uh, think through this conversation. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting with the organic because it took us a while. I kept learning more and more about glyphosate. When I first uh, heard about glyphosate back when Don Huber gave that talk, I was uh, blown away by it. I'm like, oh my God, this is it. And then I was like, oh my God, my own food, you know, and I had no idea how much glyphosate was in the food. Uh, mm -hmm. The government doesn't test it at all. I mean, the US government is completely lax about glyphosate. They don't care how much is in the food. So yeah. it, it's hard to know. And I didn't know whether the exposure was through the food or was it at the playground because they were putting glyphosate on the weeds or was it because they were living near agricultural fields where it was sprayed, you know? It's hard to know which, uh, or in the water supply, and that's another possibility. And one thing interesting about the water that I've learned only recently. Yeah. They, Go ahead, please. I want, I want to know about this. Yeah, they use chlorine, of course, in, in the water treatment plants. Chlorine mm -hmm. is very popular for uh, killing the microbes, you know, and sort of helping to make the water safe. Uh, and it turns out that um, chlorine is a very good, uh, especially chlorine dioxide, 
uh, is a very good um, a active, uh, it's a reactive uh, molecule that can break down glyphosate non-enzymatically. That's been shown in papers that have been published. So I think it's very fortuitous that um, that, that is true because they use it to purify water and they end up, I hope, removing most of the glyphosate that's in the water by doing that. Huh. Okay. I'm hoping, yeah. and I don't know for sure, but I'm hoping that's the case because otherwise we'd have huge exposure to our water supply, especially right. people who live near farms. And they still should be worried. I mean, I don't know how much of the glyphosate you can remove when there's that much in it, you know. But I suspect the people who are getting their water from a water supply that's being washed off of these farms have got to worry about glyphosate contamination in their water. Wow. Okay. Well, um, Stephanie, this was a fantastic interview. I appreciate you bringing this to, to our attention. Can you tell my listeners if they want to find out more about you, what you're all about, um, and uh, you know, where they can follow you on social media, all that good stuff? Yeah, yeah. So I'm at MIT and I have a web page at MIT, which is very techie and boring looking, but it has a huge amount of information on it. Um, it's people, P-E-O-P-L-E dot C-S-A-I-L, C -S -A -I -L, that's my lab, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, dot M-I-T dot E-D-U slash Senef, S-E-N-E-F-F, my last name. And you can Google my name. If you Google Senef, it's sufficiently unusual that you'll come up with all kinds of hits of various interviews like this one. I've done a lot of podcasts. I have some presentations that are available on, online and and you know interviews and whatnot. So there's a lot of material of that sort of that if you're more interested in that sort of thing. But there's also I have all many of my slides are available on my webpage, and also many of my most of my papers that have been published on glyphosate are available. There's a link to them on my webpage. Okay, so we're gonna more. put links to all of that in the show. Notes. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No. And uh, and you said your book's coming out probably it's next year out, sometime. Yeah, I'm, I'm due to deliver the draft by January of next year, so it'll be after that. Okay. Have to go well, when that comes out, keep me in mind. Uh, shoot me a digital copy, and we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll have you back yeah, on the podcast to talk about it. That would be great. Thank all right, you. All, right. all right, guys. Uh, first of all, Stephanie, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. All right, guys. Those of you that are listening, hold on. We'll be right back with some more information. <laughs> 